turn with me in your Bibles this evening to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. We are going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, actually uh, just looking at verse 16, making the best use of the time. But let us read this passage in its context. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Father, we do praise you and bless you and thank you for your goodness and mercy to us this evening. We thank you for being pleased to gather us together again in the name of our Savior to give us opportunity to look into your word. We again are dependent upon your Holy Spirit and do beseech you, O Lord, that he would lead us and guide us into your truth. And Father, we thank you and praise you for this. And I ask, O Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in thy sight. For as in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned for us this verse, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us, and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God doesn't often reveal to us his secret providences. We don't always know why he leads us in the direction that he does. Um, Earlier this week, I had called Matthew with two different texts that I could possibly preach on this evening. And having discussed with him, uh, decided to preach on this text in Ephesians chapter five, thinking from my own limited perspective that I would be preaching on it for one reason or one purpose when the Lord in his good providence has another reason and another purpose. Some years ago when I was down working with our missionary, Matt Baugh, in Haiti. The government blew up as a result of an election. They closed the airport down. I ended up staying in Haiti for an extra 10 days. That involved having to leave the missionary compound in the little village called Coleco to drive into the capital city to try to find out if the airplanes were going, when I could get on a plane, how I could get out. And every day I went down, and things kept getting worse and worse. It was harder to get to the airport. And one day we were coming back. We got stopped at a roadblock, and as soon as the Haitians figured out there were two Americans in the vehicle, they began to attack the truck, beat on it with sticks and throw rocks at us. And suddenly a a man picked up a huge cinder block and was running at the head of our truck, going to smash it through the window. And I turned to Matt and said, Matt, you better get us out of here. This is going to hurt really bad. We drove through a barricade and were able to get away. That evening, I said to Matt, you know, brother, it's interesting. God often brings these things into our lives to remind us of the shortness of our lives, the brevity that God has only given us so many days and appointed to us the portion of those days, and we need to use them wisely. Two weeks later, after I got home, I was sitting in my study at the seminary to get news that Matt had been killed in a motorcycle accident. So I was reflecting back on, on that time. At the time, I said to myself, boy, Lord, I didn't know how poignant the words that we were speaking that night afterwards were both to him and me. 
God had only ordained two weeks for him. This afternoon, when I was at the Hulse house, I got news that a young man, Jeremy Hill, late 30s, young man in comparison to some of us, went home to be with the Lord last night. Apparently, his body just wore out. Jeremy was a student in my classes. Jeremy also was a student that I was his faculty advisor. Jeremy was a young man that I had uh, taken to Ethiopia with me at one point. Jeremy was a young man who had a very hard life. I was telling Pastor Hulse afterwards that I really had a place in my heart for him. And part of the reason for that was because he had come from a similar background that I had come from and been saved out of. And often as Jeremy and I shared experience, I would come away saying, but by the grace of God, there had gone I. He's 39 years old, but his body was wore out. So the sermon tonight really is a focus on you young people. Some of us here in the congregation are old enough that if the Lord was to take us home tomorrow, I could honestly say and said when I had my heart attack, Lord, I'm ready to go home. I've served you well, I think. But if it's your good pleasure, give me more days. God's given me more. But I don't know how many more. And this is a reminder to me, but also to you young people, Paul's exhortation that we are to redeem the time for the days are evil. Those are the words that I want us to contemplate this evening. The theme of the book of Ephesians is probably one of the most glorious themes in all of Scripture, especially in chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul opens up to us not only the reality of the doctrine of union with Christ, but all the benefits that we as people have received and been given because we have been brought into union with Christ. That Christ is our hope. That Christ is our life. That Christ is our death. He is our resurrection. He is our ascension. He is our mediator who sits at the right hand of God always making intercession for us. That while we were in Adam, we were lost and dead in our trespasses and sins, that there is absolutely no good thing within us. But in Christ, we have been given all the treasures and blessings of heaven because God has loved his only begotten son. And the Apostle Paul continues to open up that great doctrine for us to show how it <coughs> undergirds everything we do in life, but also undergirds our prayer life, undergirds our uh, devotional life as we go before the Lord, because in that union, we walk in him in communion with God. That God who was once far off has drawn nigh unto us and he has become our surety, our strong and mighty tower, our rock of defense, our refuge, our uh, ever-present he ever help in the time of trouble. And Paul tells us in this book of Ephesians that this great doctrinal truth has profound implications for the way that we live our Christian lives. If it is true, as Paul reminds us it is, that we are in Christ, then our lives are different. As Paul says to the Corinthians, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now Paul begins to deal with that under an analogy in scripture about walking. He starts off in chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Verse 17 of chapter 4, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk and do in the futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, but you must walk as children of light, putting off all falsehood. Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore be 
imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then here in verse 15 of chapter 5, he says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as the unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Look carefully how you walk, not as the unwise, but as the wise, making the best use, buying up the time, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Now Paul says to us that in our lives, regardless of our age, but especially in those early years of our age, we should look carefully how we walk. He literally means that we should take heed, we should be aware, we should pay attention, we should be accurately assess with circumspection, with diligence, just exactly where we are walking and where we are going. It behooves us. Down in South Carolina a few weeks ago, we found a copperhead on our uh, property there. I understand the Holst found a copperhead on their property. My wife said to us, well, I thought, didn't think we were living in Africa anymore. We didn't have to be as careful as we once did. My response to her is, listen, God calls us in every circumstance, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, to learn to walk carefully. Whether we've seen a copperhead a snake or not, we must keep vigilant watch as to where we walk and what we do. He says, take heed, look carefully. Don't walk as one oblivious to your surroundings, but walk as one who understands the nature of the time in which we live. The days are evil. How you walk is a reference to the way we live our lives, not just simply as we go out the door to make sure that we turn on the porch light so we can see the area around us, but he's actually saying to us, look carefully the manner and the way of your living. How do you live before God? Now, there's a couple of ways to begin to really assess your life, and that is, one, to listen to what comes out of your mouth, because the Bible says to us that what comes out of a man's mouth is what proceeds from his heart. From the heart a man speaks. You want to know the character of your life? Listen to your speech. The Bible also says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Think about what we think about. What are your thoughts? Where does your mind run to when no one is around? What occupies your thinking that no one else can see. It tells you who you truly and really are. And so the apostle says, look carefully, brothers and sisters. Look carefully as to the manner of your life, because the days are evil. And be not like the unwise. Who are the unwise? Well, the Bible tells us the unwise are those who deny that there is a God who deny that God is in control of all that he has made, who deny that they will one day have to stand before him and give an account for all of their words and for all of their thoughts. It is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. But the Bible reminds us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and it apart from evil is understanding. And so Paul says to us, look carefully how you live your life and be as the wise. Depart from evil. Fear the Lord. Fear God. Because as Solomon tells us at the book of the uh, Ecclesiastes, this one thing I've learned, that we are to keep God's commandments. We are to fear the Lord. We are to walk in all of his ways because we will give an account. Redeeming or buying back the time. And why? And this is where I especially want you young people to listen carefully. We don't know the day nor the hour that the Lord will call us into his presence. And so the general admonition of scripture to us in times like these is redeem the time. Buy back the days. And why? 
Because Psalm 39 verse 4 says, our day is as a hand breath. You see, one of the temptations that you have as a young person is to say, I have plenty of time. But no man knows the day of God's appointment when we will stand before him. And it is surely the case that it is appointed unto us once to die and then the judgment. And God in his providence calls some early in life. He calls others later in life. But he calls each and every one of us to redeem the time. Whether God gives us 10 days, 10 years, 10 decades, it makes no difference. We must realize that our life just appears for a little while as a vapor. And when the sun rises, it is swiftly gone. It is the way to be wise. I was reflecting this afternoon as I had gotten the news and some exchanges were going on in texting and I was trying to find out exactly what was happening Moses' prayer in Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to the dust and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as it, with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and renewed, but in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all of our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our tears to an end like a sigh. The years of our lives are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Moses is telling us all about life and what we face in this life. The trials, the tribulations, the struggles, the brokenness in body, the bereavements, the persecutions, all of those things. We recognize that these things come from the hand of God God chastens us, God comforts us, God leads us. Yea, though I walk through that valley and shadow of death, we'll fear no evil, for the Lord is with us. His rod and his staff, they direct us, as the psalmist says in Psalm 23. But the psalmist then says, but Lord, teach me to number my days. Teach me to take account of each and every one of them. For each of us will stand before your throne. Isaiah 55 gives us that same theme. It tells us we have only a limited time to find God. Call upon him while he is near. Seek him while he may be found. You might be saying in your life as you are tempted by the things of this world, oh, it's okay, I have enough time, I can do it after high school, I can do it after college, I can do it when I get in my career, I can do it when I become a a husband or a wife, or I can do it when I become a father or a mother, and we know not whether we have those days. We know not whether the Lord has apportioned to us that time of graduation from high school or college or marriage. Our time is limited to find God while he is near, while he is close. 
You covenant children have been born in a covenant home. You have a privilege that many young children around the world don't have, and that is to be close to the Lord every single Lord's Day in the preaching of his word, where God calls you, where God pleads with you, where God sets before you every manner of blessing and mercy that he would bestow upon any and all who call upon his name. And would we spurn God by saying, maybe next week, Lord, maybe next month, maybe next year, maybe next time. Luke 19.42 says, if we spurn the Lord, we will look back in regret. How each of us, at one time or another, have said to ourselves, if only I could do it over again, I would do it differently. I would take the time to seek the Lord's face, to call upon his name, to look into his word, to say, what exactly does God's word have to say to me today, right now, in my present circumstance, how I am to behave, what I am to do, what I am to say, what I am to believe, what I am to hope. Oh, how I would have, if I had more time, corrected these things. And the scripture says to us, be not like the unwise. Don't wait until it's too late, but be ye wise and redeem the time. For the days are evil. John 9, 4 reminds us that we redeem the time because evil is all around us. The Bible tells us very clearly that God is the author of evil. Now, I don't mean that God is the author of sin, but God controls all things that happen in our lives. The evil of a hurricane is in the hand of God. The evil of an earthquake is in the hand of God. The evil of death is in the hand of God. The evil of war is in the hand of God. God holds all things in the palm of his hands. And what is the response of the Christian to be? It is to be to redeem the time for the days are evil. For our life is as a hand breath that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Evil is like a roaming lion seeking whom it may devour. And yet the scripture says to us, we're not to fear, but to trust. For the Lord knows how to take us through the vales and the valleys of evil. John 12, 35 says it prevents darkness from overtaking us when we redeem the time. Jesus said there's only so many hours of day. Do your work while it is day. Be not like those that say tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Today is to walk the day to walk closely with the Lord. Today is the day to be in union and communion with him. Today is to come into the presence of God's house. Oh, how many of us will regret when we get to the end of our days and our bodies have become infirmed, broken, weak, and we can't go to the Lord's house. And we look back and say, all the times and the opportunities I had to go to the Lord's house, and I didn't go. I didn't go to hear the preaching of the word. I didn't take the time to open up the scriptures. I didn't search for God diligently while he may be found. Galatians 6, 9 says to us, as we redeem the time, it will bring great reward. Because whether God has ordained our life to be short or long, if we redeem the time, he has ordained it to be full. Whether I live... 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. If I have redeemed the time in Christ, out of my union with Christ, those 10, 20, 30 years will be full years. They won't be empty, wasted years. Brethren, God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And Paul says to us, look carefully how you walk. Don't walk as the unwise, but as the wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. So how ought you then to redeem the time? It's real easy for us to throw out these phrases, redeem the time and walk away and say, what does that mean? How do I redeem the time? 
Well, first of all, the Bible would tell us we redeem the time by paying careful attention to what of necessity occupies our time. What do we do day by day? Listen, one, you young people know it more than me. I'm still a generation ago. I don't get caught up so much in internet and computer games and all that kind of stuff. But you know how much time is being wasted and consumed in the lives of people by an undisciplined use of modern technology? Hours and hours and hours spent on absolute trivia that has no eternal value for anything that you do. It might be entertaining for an hour or two or a day or a week, but it will bring you no everlasting happiness because you haven't paid careful attention to what occupies your time. It's necessary to look you see, time is the creation of God. God has given us time. It is a gift from him. It's part of what he's given us as a blessing of life so that in life, as we use that time to seek his face while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near, to walk in that union and communion with him, we might know the full blessedness and reward of all that he has made and created in this world for us to have so that we could experience that full fruit. God has given us time. We must take careful stock of how we use the time that the Lord has given. Bringing our mind captive to realize that we have a correct value of time. Listen, there is very few things in this world more precious than the time God has given. My father died a couple of years ago. And one of the things I reflected on after the Lord was pleased to take him home was how valuable the time I had with that man. I was 62 years old when he died. And I said to one of his friends, I'm 62 years old and I really don't know what I'm going to do without him. Who am I going to call when things happen that I need some advice? And it made me look and say, oh, how I appreciate the time that I had with him. Parents, the time you have with your children. Children, the time you have with your parents, with your brothers and your sisters. The time you have with fellow Christians. Value that time. It is so... I think about talking to Jeremy on Wednesday afternoon. We chatted a little bit about his internship that he had in the summer, an experience he had while he was with me on the field in Ethiopia. And I look now and say, Lord, thank you for giving me that time. I didn't value it in the way I should have Wednesday, but I certainly do now as the Lord has taken it home. Don't live a life of regret because you didn't value time. Have a correct value of time. By a structured ordering of your time. We are called the disciples of Christ because we have disciplined our lives. People come to me and say, oh, pastor, I'm too busy to do this. I'm too busy to do that. I'm too busy to do this. And it usually is, I'm too busy to read my Bible. I'm too busy to pray. I'm too busy to go to prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. I'm too busy to do this. I'm too busy to do that. Well, frankly, you're just too busy. You need to structure and order your time. God doesn't require of us any more than what he has given us time to fulfill and complete. But we must structure our time, recognizing that it is a gift from God. Doing that by properly ordering our priorities. What are the priorities of your life? Is it more important for you to talk with your friend on the telephone than it is to pick up your Bible and read? Is it more important for you to sit in front of the Game Boy or some program on a computer than it is to seek God's face in prayer? Is it more important for you to go to some place for the weekend or some place to uh, 
fritter away your time than it is to be prepared to come to the Lord's house so that you can benefit from all that God has promised to his people as they gather together in his name. What are your priorities? What do you look at? What is your, what is the queen of your week? The Puritans used to call the Lord's Day the queen of days. They used to call it the market day of the soul. That time that God has given to us in his presence, how do we value that time? And by seeking God's grace, to use your time to his glory. You see, the apostle reminds the Corinthians that whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do we pray, Lord, give us grace that we would use our time to the glory and praise of your great name. Well, the hindrances to us are just the converse of what we've just said. Ignorance of how our time is used or spent because we don't take time to ask myself the question, what have I done for the last eight hours? What's occupied my mind? What has been my speech? Where have I let myself go? Have I just simply squandered away this time doing the trivial, the mundane, the unnecessary? If my life was short and I knew it was going to be short, then I would live my life much differently. And for the Christian, he says, if the Lord tarries, he'll find me busy in kingdom work. If the Lord comes right now, he'll find me ready to go into his presence. A disregard of the value of time. Hey, it's just time. I got plenty of years, a lack of discipline. It doesn't matter. Incorrect priorities. Failure to seek God's face for the appropriate and responsible use of our time. <clears throat> Would you be wise? Paul says, be not like the unwise, but as the wise, redeeming your time. None of us want to be called fools. We've been hearing a lot in the news lately about one man calling another man moron. The Bible says to us, really, the worst thing that you can say about a man is that he is fool, a fool. It is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. But it is a fool who refuses or neglects to redeem the time. So if you'd be wise, young men, young women, as you look to your life ahead, and you want to see God's full blessing in your life, then be wise. Redeem the time. Don't let the days go by. Don't let them flitter away. Don't let them go to the point where one day you will regret and say, oh, but if only. Oh, but if only. Redeeming the time brings God's favor. God blesses those, the scripture tells us, that are wise and walk in the ways of his commandments. You see, this is, this is a commandment of God. God is not just making a suggestion. Oh, by the way, if you want to have things go a little better in your life, then keep time. No, God's commanding us. We are to redeem the time. We are to buy up the days because the days are evil. And he brings us his favor. Blessed are they that walk in the ways of the Lord that keep his commandments. His word, his commandments will be as a light to their feet, a guide in their path. Jesus said, if you would come after me, follow me, pick up your cross, deny yourself. Redeem the time. And I will open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out the blessings so abundantly you won't be able to contain all of them in your life. It delivers us from every entangling snare. Second Peter, again, as Peter, remember, I said this morning, what is the purpose of the letter of Peter? He tells us in chapter 1 and, and uh, the verse there, um, in verse 5, he says that you might call, that I might instruct you how to. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these things, that you might call them to mind. 
And he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, listen, this is the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved, and in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminders that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and the Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days. They will follow their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of your coming? But God redeems time. God keeps time. So Peter says to these believers, keep time. It delivers us from the evil snares of the day. Let me ask you some questions. Again, most specifically at you young people. Are you redeeming the time? Have you considered the reality that today is the day of salvation? That no man knows if he has been given tomorrow? that the Lord might call us home tonight. Those of us who are older, we've, we've passed the middle of our, of our lives, have we not? We're on the downhill side. The Apostle Paul said to us, or um, uh, Moses in, in Psalm 90 said to us, is given four score, three score plus 10, 70 years, Maybe by reason of strength, 80 years. That means at 40 years old, 24 years ago, I passed the middle of my life. Are you redeeming the time? Are you saying, Lord, those things which we do in this little bit is not worthy to be compared to the blessings that you will give us in all of eternity? Are we denying ourselves the luxuries of this life that we might enjoy the luxuries of heaven forever by redeeming the time. And beloved, don't be mocked. God is not fooled. God knows how we use our time. You and I don't live our lives with a punch clock. We don't usually have a sense of Someone looking over our shoulder to make sure that we are keeping time. But God keeps time. And he keeps a record of time. He keeps a record of what we do. And God is not mocked. He's not fooled. For whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. And he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. It's not easy as a Christian to be one that tries to keep time. Our flesh is against us because by nature we are lazy. The world is against us because it does not want to serve God. It wants to serve ourselves. The devil is against us and will seek to hinder us in our keeping of time because he seeks to hinder the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He seeks to hinder the proclamation of that one name, that only name, whereby men might be saved. He seeks to hinder us at every turn. So we must resist the devil that he'll flee. We must resist the world in their endeavors to turn us away. We must subdue the flesh by the spirit and walk in that newness of life, redeeming the time for the days are evil. And this is God's promise. It will bring blessing to you as you redeem the time. Parents, it will bring blessing to your children as you teach them to redeem the time for the days are evil. It will bring blessing to the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because we will be busy about the king's work and it will bring a blessing to the world because they will hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul says to us, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, 
making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another. May God teach us, brethren, to redeem the time. Let us pray. Our great God and Savior, we do praise you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We praise you, O Lord, that you have called us from the foolish things of this world and called us to be wise. And that your word teaches us that the way of wisdom is redeeming the time. Father, I especially this evening pray for the young people who are so easily tempted to believe that they have plenty of time. Tempted to think that they know your secret purposes, that you've given to them many days when we don't know the number that you've appointed. But Lord, we pray that you would grant them and us wisdom to discern, to know, and to redeem the time that you have appointed as our lot. Help us, as Moses prayed, to number our days. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.